Hey class, Adam Ward here. Uh, last video in our first Open Channel Flow lecture. Uh, and we're going to talk about changes in Streambed profile. So prior to this, we've been talking about uh, fruit numbers, subcritical and supercritical flow, and we've introduced the idea of a specific energy diagram. Uh, in this problem, we're going to take advantage of that knowledge to make some predictions. Okay, so the vision here uh, is we've got a river. It's flowing from left to right, and it's flowing along at 2.3 feet of depth, and then there's a sudden change in bed elevation. So the, the bed of the river goes up to, uh, it goes up by half a foot. And so the big question here is, what happens to the open channel flow? Does it get shallower, as I illustrated in blue? Does it not change, as I've illustrated in red? Or does it actually just go up along with the bed of the stream in green? So the question to you all is, what is the depth going to look like downstream of this bump in the stream bed? Uh, we're also given in this problem a specific discharge of 5.75 uh, square feet per second. So again, that's 5.75 cubic feet per second per one foot in and out of the screen. So take a moment, think about the strategy that you might use, uh, and then I will come back and help. Okay, folks, uh, you've got a strategy perhaps in mind. Here's what I did. And so first I thought, all right, let's apply our Bernoulli equation from the left-hand side of this bump to the right-hand side of this bump. Uh, in other words, I'm going to pick a point on the left-hand side. I'm going to pick a point. Oops, I'm going to pick a point on the right-hand side. And I'm going to write the Bernoulli equation between those two. And so, uh, there's our Bernoulli equation, and you'll notice instead of the pressure terms, I went ahead and made that substitution to describe pressure head as the equivalent depth of fluid, um, because that's what I'm after in this problem. Let's see if we can work through this and maybe simplify something. So I'll establish my datum so that zero elevation is the lowest point in the problem. So that puts the elevation of zero on the left-hand side, and we know the elevation then would be 0 0.5 feet on the right-hand side. Um, I know the y1, the depth on the left-hand side of the problem, is 2.3 feet. Uh, I don't know velocity over there, but I do know that velocity can be described as q over a. Um, I also can recognize that uh, dividing both of those, um, dividing both of those by the width b, so this written in red is a capital Q over b. Uh, if I divide the top and the bottom by b, I end up with specific discharge per depth. So I can do that calculation and I arrive at a velocity of 2.5 feet per second on the left hand side. So if we take stock of where we are, organize ourselves, combine as many constants as we can, uh, we end up with this equation. Bernoulli tells us that 1.90 must equal the depth on the right-hand side, y2, plus the velocity head on the right-hand side. Now, if you're playing along at home, you know this is trouble. We've got one equation with two unknowns in it, so we're not yet ready to get to a solution. So what other things could we use to solve this problem? We also know conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. I'm going to go ahead and pick conservation of mass, um, generally being the simpler of those two options. And so what we know is the mass rate coming in must equal the mass rate flowing out, or the mass rate at point one must equal the mass rate at point two. Or specific discharge must be the same. Uh, that assumes the width of the channel doesn't change. And so with that knowledge, uh, we can combine that with our Bernoulli equation and we end up with the following. The y2 cubed minus 1.90 times y2 squared plus 0 0.513 equals 0. So this is 100% a solvable equation. And what you can be sure of is that the depth downstream of that bump is either 1.72 feet or 0 0.638 feet or negative 0.466 feet. So we know the negative is not physically meaningful, but that still doesn't get us to an answer. 
what that tells us is there are two possible depths that might exist. So I want to draw our specific energy diagram once again uh, and talk you through this problem. So let's start in red. We know that the depth was 2.3 feet upstream. So I started on the y-axis at a value of 2.3 feet. And shown in these red arrows, I read horizontally over to the specific energy line and down to the x-axis. And so the energy at point 1, that's something that we can actually calculate. Uh, the depth at 1 plus the velocity head at point 1. So I calculated a specific energy of 2.40. Now, what happened when we went from the left-hand side of that diagram to the right-hand side? Well, we had, we had an increase in bed elevation. Right? And so that increase in bed elevation uh, shows up as a decrease in specific energy. So our specific energy is going to drop by 0.5 feet. If we drop the specific energy by 0.5 feet, where does that leave us? Right? So you can sort of see I've I've now got this yellow arrow, I'm moving to the left by 0.5 feet. And that tells me one of two things must be possible. Right? I know the new specific energy, but I don't know if it's subcritical or supercritical flow. I know that I'm existing at one of those two points, either the deeper subcritical flow or the shallower supercritical flow. Uh, so good in that we've graphed our solution out, but the key question now is, did we pass through the critical point? Uh, in other words, did we cause our flow to do what the pink arrow says here? We started uh, at that sort of top right point, and we pushed the flow past the critical point, and we accelerated it all the way around until it became supercritical. Or did we do what I've shown in blue, we just scooch down on the subcritical arm. We never pushed it all the way around that critical point. So we have the answer. It is written on this slide. Right? We know the actual depth at the downstream side. We're just not sure which of those values it is. So how can we do this? And the answer is going to be to analyze the critical point. So we know that the specific energy at that critical point is 3 halves times the critical depth, or 3 halves multiplied by our equation for critical depth. So we can go ahead and plug those numbers in. So I've got gravity down in the denominator now. I've got my specific discharge squared up in the numerator, all of that raised to the 1 3rd power. And so the specific energy at the critical point is 1.51 feet. So consider our energy equation, right? That tells us that the specific energy plus the depth at one would have to equal the specific energy plus or plus the bed elevation z at the critical point. So specific energy plus bed elevation is being conserved. Right? And if you're feeling a little unhappy about this, just remember that that specific energy represents the flow depth plus the velocity head or put another way, the pressure head plus the velocity head. Right. So that's our energy equation, assuming we were at critical flow. And the question here would be, did we raise the bed enough to cause critical flow to occur? So we can plug in values that we know. We know our specific energy at point one was 2.40 feet. We know the bed elevation at point one was zero, our datum. We know the critical energy is 1.51. And so what was the bed elevation? How high would that bump have to be to push us around to supercritical flow? And what we can do is solve that for 0 0.89 feet. So let's look at our problem again. We had a bed elevation. We had that sort of bump of 0 0.5 feet. The bump that we made was not enough to breach the critical point. It's less than that z crit value. That means we did not pass the critical point, and we want to go with the subcritical solution, the larger of those two depths of 1.72 feet of depth on the right-hand side. Now, what if instead of 0 0.5, 
What if we had a raise in the stream bed that was 0.89 feet or more? So we were more than that critical depth or that critical bed elevation. If we were more than that critical bed elevation, what would happen is on the specific energy diagram, we would go around and pass through critical flow before we got back to the subcritical or supercritical solution. Right. In other words, that depth on the right hand side would be the smaller value, the supercritical solution, 0.638 feet. Um, and what you would have done is you accelerated that flow sort of around the corner of the specific energy diagram. So if we just doodled our specific energy uh, and you thought of where we started, where we started as being here. So that would be, of course, at the coordinates of E1, Y1. Uh, what we've done in this problem, uh, if, if this right-hand side were true, what you would have done is go all the way around the end to the, to the supercritical solution. Okay, so what I'm hoping you take away from uh, this recording is how you can work with things you already know. So conservation of energy, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, uh, and use, use those fundamental processes to analyze open channel hydraulics. Um, the specific energy diagram is admittedly unintuitive, and so working with it through an example problem or two, um, I hope helps you understand what this diagram does and how you can use it to decide if you stay in the subcritical flow regime or if you move into the supercritical flow regime. Uh, in our next lectures, we'll look at hydraulic jumps, which take us from supercritical up to subcritical, uh, and we'll again use mass, energy, and momentum to analyze that system. All right, folks, thanks for sticking with me, and I will see you back in lecture. Have a great day.